So this is Falling Grace. Sometimes I make these videos that I call licks and ideas. And I had made one over Bright Size Life and somebody asked, can you make a similar video for Falling Grace? The thing is that Falling Grace, I wouldn't use licks. If you follow my channel, you know that I'm one of those jazz teachers that think you should learn licks. It's a topic that often comes up in jazz education. But for this tune, Falling Grace by Steve Swallow, I would try to use a different approach for practicing it and soloing over it. A more, I guess, lyrical approach, something like Wayne Shorter would do. Not that I can play like Wayne Shorter by any stretch of the imagination, but we can try. Or a guitar player would be, I guess, Jim Hall. I think Jim Hall recorded it with Pat Metheny. Pat Metheny plays this tune a lot, so you might have heard it with Pat Metheny. But it's originally, I think, from a Gary Burton record. So how would I practice this? I wouldn't practice the stuff I normally talk about, like bebop stuff, Barry Harris stuff, bob scales, anything like that. So I'll show you some ideas. A lot of them comes from studying with Scott Henderson, things that I learned from Scott Henderson. So let's get right into it, shall we? But first we need to just learn the tune. And this video is for those of you who, you need to know your modes and the modes of the melodic minor, right? and uh, need to be able to read music and that kind of stuff. Otherwise, you won't get much out of this video. But for those of you who feel like you're a serious jazz student, let's get started with Falling Grace. <laughs> So there's a little ending, there's an outro. Just continues on that cycle. There are a lot of things about this tune that is kind of unusual and different. The form is unusual. People say that it's, uh, what is it, 14 plus 10 or something like that. I, just, I, I don't know why it's divided like that. I think of it as just like through composed. It's just one thing. Nothing really repeats, even though the melody has a, there's some motifs that repeats, but no section of the tune comes back. There are no repeat signs. It's not really functional harmony. It's not, you know, like what key is this tune in? It's not really in any key, but it's not also, it's not really a functional harmony even though it's not completely non-functional harmony either, it's somewhere in between. It has like two fives and dominance and stuff like that, but there is no sense of key. It's just like you think you are in a key, but then it kind of keeps moving. So there's a, this sense of moving that is very interesting. Pat Metheny talks about this tune in his Rick Beato interview, and he talks about that this tune opened the door to something else. So if you follow like the tradition of jazz, somewhere in between regular jazz standards and then what came after more non-functional harmony. But it's still, again, it's very uh, beautiful. It's not like completely free, you know. So let's hear what Pat Martini has to say. But I have to really always go to the tune Falling Grace yep. by Steve Swallow, Steve Swallow yeah. which to me somehow opened the door to something. Yeah. And I'm not quite sure I could 
place what that is exactly. But it was, to me, that tune sort of started a way of thinking about harmony that was kind of n not exactly linear in the sort of, you know, Tin Pan Alley kind of way. It was more like the, the individual movements. It could be the bass note, it could be a, the way a common tone cuts across more chords than usual. Yeah. You know, there were so many different angles you could look at that set of changes. And I mean, I still do. I right. still can, I mean, I sometimes I'll just play Falling Grace in all 12 keys for five or six hours. It's just infinities kind of represented there. Not to mention this particular compositional device that he got to in that tune, where the tune wraps around on itself. Right. So to me, that tune was a breakthrough tune for many people. Yes. I mean, uh, it, just sets a, it just sets a slightly different tone, and I was certainly responding to that. Uh, and, and in particular, because we were playing it every night. You know, right. That was like the, you know, con con constantly the third tune in the set. Okay, so how would I practice solo over this? I'll show you some ideas. These chords are, these chord changes are pretty tricky. So I suggest that you practice it in sections. And the good thing about iReal Pro, the iReal Pro app, is that you can actually do that. You can highlight, just press uh, the screen, the bars you want to practice. So let's practice the first four bars. And before I do anything else, I need to decide on scales. So for the A flat, I'm gonna practice Lydian, or I'm gonna think Lydian. And for the D, I'm gonna think Alter. You don't have to do that, but I'm gonna do that. And then Dorian for the G. So those are the scales I'm gonna use. So I'm gonna use Lydian, Alter, and Dorian. So what I'm looking for, the exercise I'm going to show you, what I'm looking for are scales that don't have avoid notes in them. So Lydian and Dorian, there's no avoid note. And Altered also doesn't have any avoid note, meaning there's no note that it sounds wrong, like it doesn't want to be there. So I, I'm thinking of it kind of modally, even though you could argue, well, it shouldn't be Lydian there or whatever. I'm going to play any time there's a major seven chord, I'm going to think Lydian. Every time there's a dominant, I'm going to think one of the modes of melodic minor and Dorian for minor seven. There is also a diminished chord there. So there I would just play a diminished scale, meaning a whole half. But again, we're just going to look at the first four bars here. The first exercise I want you to do is to just play on one string. Going up. And then when the chord changes, you need to keep going to the next note in the new scale and continue and then change when the chord changes. So this is something Scott Henderson showed me. It's a great exercise. I've heard people, some people call it the eternal scale exercise. So I'm actually going to bring down the tempo a little bit here. So this is where whatever you feel is a good tempo for you shouldn't be too slow because then you don't get a feel for the moving harmony, but uh, it can be pretty slow. So this is 110 and then I highlight those bars and then I'm going to play on the top string and I'm only going to play on that string and I'm going to play to uh, maybe to the G up here. Then I'm going to turn around. You could do the whole string, but I don't know how many frets you have. So we're going to turn around on the G here. So there are a couple of things I need to be aware of. I need to know what notes I'm playing. F, G, A flat, B flat, C. That, that's the first thing. Then I need to know how that note relates to the chord. So the F is the 13th, the G is the 7th, the A flat is 
the root. That's actually the least good note on the major seven chord. That root is actually kind of awkward, but it's it's not an avoid note. But it's not the best option. And then the B flat is a ninth. Okay, now the next chord is coming up. I need to find the closest note, which is C. And then that which is the flat seven. And the D is the root. Okay, now the next chord is coming up. What is the closest note? What is the E, which is the 13th? And the F, which is the flat seventh. And then we're back to A flat because I'm only practicing the first four bars. So the G is the major seven. The F is the 13th. E flat is the fifth. The D is the sharp 11. The C is the flat 7, B flat is the flat 13. Ninth. So I need to know all these things at the same time. So some people do the exercise this way. You could also do that when, for example, the chord changes the B flat, I can repeat the B flat over the next chord. But I think it's a better idea to go to the next note because then it's like you're playing a, a melodic idea, something that's moving and the audience or whoever is listening can kind of follow you on. It's like you're telling a story. And if you're using melodic minor modes and the modes of major scale, the next note of the next chord is always going to be a half step or a whole step away. There's no way it's gonna be anything else. If you if it's not a half step or whole step away, you're doing the exercise wrong, right? Because there aren't any bigger intervals in those scales. If you introduce the harmonic minor in the modes of that scale, then that is a different thing. But we're not doing that here. So there should always be a note available in whatever direction you're going, a half step or a whole step away. You know, you're always a half step or whole step away from a good note. If this is overwhelming, do it with just one chord first and then the next chord before you try to do it with the chord changes. But the whole idea of playing chord changes is when you need to be able to play something when the chord changes. So let's, I could develop this idea. I didn't like that uh, I read from, I'm gonna play a loop instead. <laughs> could go add something to that right or maybe a large interval listening can kind of follow along on this and when the chord changes you don't want to stop whatever you're doing because you don't know what the notes are in the next chord you don't want to I think Wayne Shorter said that that I don't want the next chord to get in the way of the idea that I'm play, you developing you know by the way, I have made a video about this before in like motifs, motific playing, and I'll put a link to it in the description. Because you can take this idea and, you know, make it more difficult. You can play chords, depending on like how advanced you are. Here is the most important thing about this. And I think I mentioned that in my previous video. And this is something Scott Henderson told me that always stayed with me. When you're practicing this, Let's say you play your notes and you know you're playing this note and, and there's a root and then it's a ninth. And here comes a D7, you're supposed to play a, a note from the D alter scale. And you just can't think of it. Your brain kind of freezes and you don't know, wait, what are the notes? Like it's too much to think. What you want to do then 
stop what you're doing, stop the playback if it's Iron Pro or a loop pedal or whatever you're using, and figure it out. Oh yeah, the next note is the C, which is the flat seven of D. And then you start over, and this time you do it right. And if you can't find the next note, you do the same thing there. And if you do that, what you've actually done is you've learned something. You programmed yourself with new information. So even if you put the guitar away after that, that day, that's a way more effective way of practicing than, you know, watching a YouTube video or playing along with the backing tracks, you know, and just noodling for 10 hours, which is not, doesn't really do anything. This is a much more effective way of practicing, especially if you want to learn how to play over changes. Because what you're doing, ultimately, you're practicing a way that will enable you to play these melodic ideas. So that, you know, that's something very difficult to do. And uh, this will help you with that. Just one thing to think about is that when we're doing this, we're not practicing creativity or anything musical. It's just basically theory. So we're using our kind of thinking side of the brain, not the creative side of the brain, but we're preparing so that when we are up there on the bandstand, you want to let all that stuff go. And you're not, that's not how you're supposed to think when you're playing. And also, if I play a melodic idea, it's not necessarily always the best idea to move that idea and in the exact perfect scale for the next chord, if you know what I mean. Sometimes you actually want to keep the shape of the idea, even though it's outside of that scale, could actually sound better. So it's... It, there's a little bit of a mistake to think that jazz players always play the correct scale for every chord. If you transcribed any solo by any of the jazz masters, like the greatest of the great, like John Coltrane, Miles Davis, they play wrong notes all over the place. And that's not because they're not any good. It's because it doesn't, the point is not to play the perfect notes of every chord. It, that actually would sound I don't know, it's unrealistic. The most important thing is, you know, the motif and the idea and the timing and the tone and how you're interacting with other musicians and, and your kind of, how you're expressing yourself and all that stuff. This is just theory. So that was the eternal scale. Next exercise is just to play a scale somewhere in this four bar phrase and target a note of the next chord. So this is what I was taught was targeting notes. Some people call this kind of practicing. Targeting notes. I don't know why that would be targeting notes. To me, those are just playing chord tones, arpeggios, which is also a good way to practice. But targeting notes is targeting a note. So if I have the first chord, I could target any of the notes of the altered scale because any of the note would sound good. So if I play the scale from here, from the root, I would be targeting the flat 13 and it would sound like this. Let's say I start a beat later, so one, two, three, four, one. Sounds like that. Then I would be targeting the third or the flat four, if you were thinking altered, but it's the third of the chord. So I'm thinking about the note that I'm aiming for and I need to be aware of how that note relates to that chord. And then ultimately, if you can do that, you can also, you can continue. So you just kind of transition from one scale to another. I want you to notice though, there's a huge difference between landing on a note that 
kind of belongs to the previous scale, like the first example. That sounds kind of smooth, but if you're landing on a note that this did not exist in the first scale, it sounds a little bit more awkward, right? So just be aware of that. And again, sometimes it's actually better to land on a wrong note because the ear might be wanting to hear that note. Just something to be aware of. Also, you should be aware of that these two scales, A flat Lydian and D altered, which is which is E flat melodic minor. They share the same notes except one note. It's the G that drops to G flat, which is F sharp. So if you're thinking of it that way, it's not as much information instead of thinking, oh, there's seven new notes. Well, it's actually just one note changing. Right? So there I was like kind of targeting those notes that are outside of the A flat scale, if that makes sense. So now I'm gonna try that over the tune. I'm gonna start on beat two of every other bar of a four bar phrase and play a scale and land on a note of the third bar of the four bar phrase. Bear with me. same thing but you try start on not the root start on another note start on the third perhaps so we start C you want to try to start on any note and target all of the notes so I'm thinking of the course the scales kind of like chords so the notes of the A flat are these right A flats third fifth seventh ninth sharp extended arpeggios and then with the altered chord I'm thinking from the E flat. The altered you have to treat a little bit different. So I'm actually deriving it from the melodic minor and doing it from there. And the G minor. So playing the scale as arpeggios. 
Okay, so that was the next uh, way to practice this. You do that over the whole tune, but you do it in sections of four bars at a time, and then ultimately you want to tie it all together. So to me, Steve Swallow is all about like the open triads and inversions. So I want to try triads over this tune, open triads. Because the, what is it that is so special about this tune? It's like the harmonic movement. open triads so if I start on the A flat in a root position and I try to find the closest open triad of the D is this G minor is here first inversion right F minor would be here and then uh, what do we have B flat just going up on the same set of strings and if I do that we kind of like a Bach you know like cello suites could do that uh. sound of the open triads and that kind of brings out that unique harmony of this tune then you could kind of use that in your soloing to mix in those open triads <laughs> play all these chords with all the extensions like 11s and 13s on every chord you're actually not bringing out the triadic nature of this tune you're uh, kind of uh, obscuring it I'm not saying you can't do that but uh, I would go more for a triadic sound in the Rick Beato interview Pat Bettini says that he likes to practice this tune in every key so you know how I will pro offers this option of Every time you play it, it transposes like a fifth. You can choose, and I would recommend going up in fifths or fourths. And if you do that, and the exercise I just did, just playing open triads. In every key, then you have a really, really serious workout ahead of you. Just one more thing that you can do to kind of get into the mindset of a more modern jazz player it's an exercise i can't remember who showed this to me but this I, the idea of locating the half step because in any again if we're using modes of the major scale and melodic minor there is two half steps in those scales right let me repeat that so there's two places in those two scales where there's a half step then the diminished scale is going to be different but which means i can try to find the half step and locate it so the a flat there's a half step between the d and the e flat and then between the g and the a flat and the next chord d altered i there's between d and e flat and then there's a half step between where is it Oh, the 
F and the F sharp or G flat. So if I try to find a half step, it could sound something like this. I broke the rule what I was doing just to show you that it felt more natural to me to continue that idea even though the F sharp doesn't belong to that scale it's just a I thought it was a, be a good demonstration of how sometimes the melodic motif is more important than playing the right scale but if you're practicing you should stick try to stick to the, the scales so an inverted minor second is a major seven. So you can do the same thing with what we just did, but play them as major sevenths instead. And then you get kind of this large intervallic playing, which is kind of modern, right? So something like this. <laughs> So opens up your thinking so that you kind of become aware of the scales and if you think about it if you know what the half steps are well the rest is just whole steps so it kind of helps all right so that was all I had for how to kind of work on the tune Falling Grace uh, let me know in the comments if this was helpful and if there are other tunes you want me to kind of make similar videos of and with that I as always, I want to thank you for your time and attention, and I shall see you next time.